If you want to engage in neuroplasticity after age 25, first of all, I should mention that it's not a strict cutoff on your 25th birthday, right? You can still learn things passively, but you need focus. So you actually need to concentrate on what you're trying to learn or change. That could be a cognitive skill, new language, mathematics, new information about the world, or a physical skill that you're trying to learn. That focus requires a certain baseline level of alertness and attention. You can't be sleepy and, and expect to be focused. So you need alertness and you need focus. Let's go hand in hand. And there's a neurochemical system called the catecholamines. You don't need to know the name, but the catecholamines include dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. They're you know, close cousins. You can think of them sort of as like the Danes, the Swedes, and the Norwegians. They, they work similarly, but they're different too. And they collaborate to create these states of focus and alertness. There are several things that you can do to increase focus and alertness, and thereby the catecholamines, or increase the catecholamines. There are, of course, drugs and pharmaceuticals that will do this, but many of those are also drugs of abuse. So we certainly don't recommend that. But for instance, caffeine is an interesting example. It works through different mechanisms, but it does increase epinephrine. It does raise alertness. Up to a certain dosage, it will increase focus. Nicotine, and here I should point out, you certainly, I'm not encouraging people to take these drugs, but nicotine works on, on the same sorts of receptors involved in a different neurotransmitter system to raise alertness and focus. So there are drugs that can do it. There are also non-drug so-called behavioral approaches. Anything that raises your adrenaline, which is epinephrine, adrenaline and epinephrine are the same thing, will increase your level of focus for what will soon be obvious reasons. There are a number of ways to do this. You can uh, frighten yourself. You can also be very excited, positively excited about something. Right? So the arousal that you experience from fear and the arousal that you experience from excitement is essentially the same arousal. It just has what we call a different valence. One we feel is negative, one we feel is positive. You can take a cold shower, you can exercise. All of these will raise epinephrine, adrenaline levels in your brain and blood. In particular, dopamine is a molecule that is exceptionally good at tightening our focus and engaging the neuroplasticity process. And dopamine is mainly thought of as a chemical of reward and feeling good, but it's actually a chemical of positive anticipation and motivation. So one way that you can increase dopamine, epinephrine, and the various other catecholamines that can engage focus is to try and create subjectively a positive anticipation around what, what it is that you're trying to learn. But if you're dreading learning something, then you can use some external approach. For instance, you could uh, and here I'm not joking, you could use cold shower, you could uh, get into an ice bath. You'll, it's been shown that you can get a greater than doubling of dopamine and epinephrine, very long lasting. If those approaches aren't attractive to you, and I can understand why they might not be attractive to a number of people, anything that gets you positively aroused and, and, and more alert is working through those chemical systems. Now the second part of neuroplasticity is equally important, and that's the time in which the real configurations, the changes in those neural maps occur, and that does not occur during learning. It does not occur in high attentional states. It occurs during sleep and non-sleep deep rest. So sleep is obvious, you know, and everyone should, uh, it's obvious what it is, and people should strive to get quality sleep of sufficient duration at least 80% of the nights that they're alive, in my opinion. There's so many reasons. It's the foundation of mental health, physical health, and performance. But in addition to that, there's this thing called non-sleep deep rest, which includes things like meditation, yoga nidra, but nowadays there are also so-called NSDR, non-sleep deep rest scripts available on YouTube and elsewhere free of cost. Non-sleep deep rest has been studied in a couple of different contexts and if done within the four to eight hours after trying to learn something, it's been shown to accelerate neuroplasticity. In particular, NSDR in the form of what's called typically called yoga nidra it involves no movement of just lying there on the ground, basically listening to a script or sitting in a chair listening to this deep relaxation script, has been shown in what's called positron emission tomography study to increase the basal levels of circulating dopamine by 65% in the particular circuits of the brain that are involved in action and action planning. So this is remarkable, and what it points to is the fact that non-sleep deep rest can really mimic some of the deeper restorative capacities of sleep. And to be very clear, we have the focused alert stage in which you're trying to learn, you're trying to learn, trying to learn, and then you have the sleep at night, and then you can also do these 10 to 30 minute or even up to an hour, but most people uh, generally will do 10 to 30 minute non-sleep deep rest of the sort of yoga nidra or shallow naps. Should you nap or not? Well, it depends. Only nap if you, 
doesn't interfere with your nighttime sleep. Naps of 90 minutes or less, so 20 minutes, 10 minutes, but up to 90 minutes typically are okay for most people, but not too late in the day if it interferes with your nighttime sleep. And then there's a final point, which is that you can accelerate learning further by spiking adrenaline, epinephrine, after trying to learn something. This has been repeatedly shown in beautiful studies by Larry Cahill and James McGaw, that whatever you use, whether or not it's high intensity, interval training type exercise or a cold shower or something that gets you really excited and, and you know, ramped up, done within the five to 15 minutes after trying to learn, stamps down a certain uh, pattern of activity in the brain as important. And that makes sense. If you think about traumatic experiences, something happens and then we get this huge spike in, in all these uh, chemicals, in particular epinephrine, adrenaline. And that serves to stamp down and solidify the, that pattern of neural activity that just occurred as a vital one. And if you've ever heard that every experience you have changes your brain, that your brain will be different after, for instance, this conversation that we're having now, as opposed to before, that's not necessarily the case. You need focus, which requires a certain level of alertness, then you need sleep, and you need non-sleep deep rest, and there's this additional thing of, if you can spike adrenaline post-learning, well then you also will serve to enhance the probability that you'll learn the material more, more quickly. And as a final, final point, I'll just say that the best way to learn is to embark on an activity where you're getting things right about 85% of the time. So if you're trying to figure out how difficult a lesson in language or how difficult a dance maneuver or how difficult a new physical skill related to sport should be, well, you should be able to get it right about 85% of the time. A 15% error rate serves, it seems, to create a state of focus that's optimal for learning and neuroplasticity.